15 minutes of fame. I'm trying to extend mine right now. He used to be Brett. Now he's Brett. People on the street recognize me. You are known as the woman who lives in the biggest house in America. You want to be famous? It's like a drug addiction. I love it. I want more. It hasn't changed her at all. She was crazy before she <laughs> crazy. This is your entourage. Yes. That's what celebrities do. All right, a little about me. I'm recently married. I work with my wife on this show, and I'm learning how to be a dad to two amazing kids in a blended family. <laughs> I'm hosting a talk show because there's a lot to talk about. This is the adventure. Let's go. All right, today, variations on a theme. The theme is fame. Specifically, we're talking about 15 minutes of fame. You're thrust into the spotlight. Your life changes. People start to treat you differently. You get things for free. And like a great drug, you just want more and more and more. I'm trying to extend mine right now. <laughs> Today, three stories about people in the midst of their 15 minutes. Our first guests found themselves famous after they set out to build the biggest house in America. And their story was made into a documentary called The Queen of Versailles. Roll it. I'm David Siegel, King of Versailles. How long have you been King of Versailles for? Since the Queen of Versailles came out. My name is Jackie Siegel. I was in the movie The Queen of Versailles. And the reason you're here is because you're interviewing me. <laughs> oh, <laughs> don't get me going. <laughs> This house is 26,000 square feet, um, for size 90,000 square feet. What do you think about your wife's collections of stuff? You want to put me in a bad mood, don't you? <laughs> the closet gets so big, it's easier for me to go shopping for a black skirt than it is to find a black skirt in my closet. <laughs> We're raising eight children. And then with my wife, that's the ninth house. I heard that. <laughs> I own the largest privately owned timeshare company in the world. I decided to build the largest home in America and uh, named it Versailles. During the filming of the documentary, that's when the recession started and we decided let's live within our means just like the rest of the country should. And that's what we're doing. Okay, so now um, I'm gonna take you over to the master bedroom. I actually have become very attached to this property. <laughs> Maybe I'll keep this as my guest house. Or actually, David said I can live here and he can live there. You know, we'll work it out. <laughs> David and Jackie are here. So we've set the stage now to build the biggest house. But I, I want to go backwards first. You guys didn't just fall into money. You started out like a lot of people do, with not a lot. Started when I was four years old with a paper out. <laughs> I didn't know back then that at four you're not supposed to be working and uh, grew up. That's uh, child labor. <laughs> <laughs> Last time I checked. <laughs> so this was in your blood to earn a buck and to try and be your own guy, an entrepreneur. My whole life. Yeah. And so you built this company really from scratch. I did. I started 1980 with 16 villas in the back of an orange grove and uh, didn't even put in a, a swimming pool or clubhouse. We now have over 10,000 villas. So when did it change? When, was, there a, was there a time when you realized, I'm rich, really rich? <laughs> I think when I married Jackie, that's when I felt rich. Aw, thank you. <laughs> He's well practiced. <laughs> So there, the reason I'm setting it up this way is there was a point where your life began to change when you realize I'm going to have a lot of money because it's the mindset I'm curious about. A couple who can set out to build the biggest house in America is very different from a person at home that's just trying to make a payment on their house. So that's what I'm trying to get inside. We don't feel different. Uh, it just happened. Uh, we like... Uh, the better things in life, but we, we live a normal life. Uh, 
for we us. Do, we, we do. We live a, like actually a very normal life, a very relaxed life at home. We don't make our maids wear uniforms and all that. It's very casual. And well, <laughs> most people don't have maids. I'm sorry. <laughs> Well, I think what you're hitting on is really interesting, is that, Jackie, you're very likable. You know, I've seen this documentary. You're, you're, you, I root for you, but Thank I you. don't find your lifestyle normal at all. You don't? <laughs> well, now, come on. You, you know you're not living a normal lifestyle. Let me give you an, an idea of how big a 90,000-square-foot home is, and then we'll decide if it's normal. Roll it. This is so beautiful. This is our grand ballroom. We have the grand staircase on each end. Okay, this is the staircase that I would come up if I was going to visit the children. But this is our ice skating slash roller rink. And we're gonna have like um, an orchestra up here. Uh-huh. For black tie affairs. Jackie, that's your room. No, that's not my room. Where's your room? That's my closet. Uh, no way. <laughs> no way. All right, so beautiful home that is still under construction mm -hmm. as part of this story. But just so we can clarify, Jackie, so you get a little insight, if nothing else, okay. just simply show of applause. Uh, this is not a normal life, right? Okay, doesn't mean it's a bad life. It, it's, a, it's an exciting life to live. That's why we want to talk to you. It's that, it's that thing that everybody would love to have, which is a life where there really are no limits. But and you're in the progress of building this house. This is what the documentary covers. You guys are making this incredible home that we just saw. 2008 hits. The market starts to turn. And yeah. things take a different route. Actually, uh, the banks froze. And our business depended on easy access to financing. We had to do what the whole country should be doing. We had to live within our means. And David came home, excuse me, um, one, one day, and he had to self-finance the company since the banks froze, and he wanted to save as many jobs as possible. And, and he said to me, he says, honey, um, I, I want to have a little talk with you. He says, I want to stop construction on the house, if it's okay with you. How did that impact you? Um, actually, I was fine with it. I mean, we still are living in a 26,000 square foot house on a private island, so it's not like <laughs> we're struggling that bad. But, <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, what are you sorry about? <laughs> Is it hard to say that you're building a home that has 10 kitchens, a bowling alley, two tennis courts, you know? Well, I, what, what's hard for me is that, um, um, see, I love people for who they are. And half my friends are like, the, the, I don't care if they're a waitress or, or they're a, a billionaire. I like people for who they are. And people don't realize that um, I really am down to earth. And what bothers me is that there's a, a lot of people out there, like critics, that are very negative about me. And I'm not a negative person. And I feel bad that they talk about me so bad. Maybe out of jealousy? I don't know. Or controversy, maybe. Or both. Or both. Yeah. <laughs> I want to pop up. Let's get a reaction from the audience out here. <laughs> pop up. What's your name? Karen Marks. What do you What do you make of this right now? They seem like a very nice couple. Well, I like the idea of the fact that they are saving jobs because I think that a lot of America are out of work and and people are struggling. Thank you. Thank you. Pop up here. Let's get you in on this. What's the emotional reaction to this story? I am so delighted that you have a great life. I'd like to see how much you're donating, what you're you know, doing as far as charity work goes. That'd be real important right now. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. <laughs> let, me, let me tell you about our charity since she brought it up. Uh, last week, we gave a thousand free vacations at Westgate Resorts to all the military that served in <laughs> Afghanistan. Two weeks ago, we, we bought school supplies for 700 underprivileged children in Orlando. 
We have a Westgate Resorts Foundation that raises over $2 million a year, supports over 100 charities in all the cities where we have resorts. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why I'm here, and that's why I'm trying to the word get out that our business stayed profitable throughout. We had one project in Las Vegas that we had to sell as a result of the uh, lender stopped funding it. But other than that, our other 27 resorts in 11 states around the country are prospering. And in fact, today we're the most profitable in our entire 32 year history. What's been the reaction from people close to you with everything that's going on now? All my friends want to want me to do a reality show and they want to be on the show. <laughs> Sure he gets we'll be we'll be on time how has it changed you there was a point where there were no cameras in your life nobody knew who jackie siegel was it hasn't changed her at all she was crazy before she <laughs> <took her. laughs> they've got it going on live from news for new york this is a special report new york we now return to the jeff probe show Lighthearted, having a great time in life, and I do have a closet bigger than most people's homes. Isn't it great? I have the most famous closet in the world right now. I even have a discotheque in there. <laughs> <laughs> and, and why? Why shouldn't? Why shouldn't she? If we can afford it? I mean, no one gave us anything. I earned every, everything I have. I... Thank you. I. I work 24-7. I don't play golf. My only hobby is work. My hobby is making other people's lives better. And uh, if we can afford it, why not? Just like when they asked me three or four years ago, why are you building the largest home in America? And I was a little cocky, and I said, because I can, and I could, you know. This is a family that has eight kids. And one of the things you guys say in the movie is, why eight kids? Because we can afford them. And we're overachievers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I wouldn't have had eight kids if I didn't have nannies. So what is the status of the house now? Because if you watch the movie, mm -hmm. where you're left with is this cliffhanger, which is, this house may not be finished. And you kind of say, I'm not selling it. But I, we're going to have to wait a minute before we finish it. Well, I hate to ruin the ending for everyone that hasn't seen it, but... We lived happily ever after is a conclusion. The house is uh, uh, back under construction and the company is doing the best it's ever done in its history. Yeah, I, I think you mentioned to somebody that the elevators just went in this week in the home. Glad to hear yeah. it's coming along just yeah. fine. Yeah, we have two <laughs> elevators, a his and a hers. No. So, oh, no, it's not a his and a hers. What is the value of a house like this? When you build a 90,000 square foot house, what does it cost? When it's finished, it'll be worth $100 million. $100 million in your home. No, I didn't say I was going to spend $100 million. I said it'll be worth $100 million. Got it. <laughs> so, Jackie, where is fame right now in your life? Because you, you, you will be famous for a while as the woman who lives in the biggest house in America. Mm -hmm. But you're going to now have to feed that vein. You're going to have to yeah. keep that drug going. I can yeah. see it's in you. You like this. It's like a drug addiction. Yeah. <laughs> I not, know. not that I ever did drugs before, but... Like, you know? <laughs> but it is a drug. Yeah. Yeah. It's the same feeling. Is there any part of you that comes home and says, I do have too much stuff? Um, no, no, no. Your husband's no. nodding. No, no. Because what I do, I, I opened up a thrift mart um, when we went through tough times, and it's a charity. So people can go there, and if they're lucky, they'll get a you know, Chanel jacket for, you know, really cheap. Jeff, <laughs> Jackie has a closet full of shoes. She could open a shoe store. She comes out here, and guess what? She goes shopping and buys a new pair of shoes. I mean... <laughs> So it I'm asking. Blows my mind. Everything, <laughs> everything I'm wearing probably didn't cost a hundred dollars. He gets his clothes from the thrift mart. <laughs> no, I... Hey, I get mine from Odeo Drive. <laughs> well, I, okay, I'm, but I'm, I'm asking a serious question yeah. because 
there's a little bit of a disconnect, as charming mm -hmm. as you are, mm -hmm. when I talk to you and you really think there's, you don't have too much stuff. I think, where is, where's the you, the real you, and where's this Jackie that's a personality? Because when you have so many, one of the things you say is, yeah. it'd be easier to go buy another skirt than to try oh. to find the one I have. <laughs> well, now that you bring it up that way, um, yeah, it is kind of <laughs> hard to find, like, like, I, I have You're like hoarders, in a sense, <laughs> right? Um, in a rich hoarder way. Yeah. <laughs> you're right, you're right, we are. I guess I'll have to admit to... <laughs> Do you ever think you have too much stuff? It's okay oh, if you don't. No, no, because what's going to happen is the clothes that I bought 15 years ago or so, maybe in another, uh, it's vintage now. So, I mean, it's going up in value. Paint, paint the future for me. What's the next move for you to hold on to this fame? Because David doesn't care. <laughs> He's it. got uh, ego and respect, but he doesn't need the fame. No, he, he doesn't need the... He's, he's been famous. Um, I, th I think I'm, I'm going to come out and do a show. I can't really talk about what I'm going to do, but I'm going to do it. And a reality I, show. Yeah. It, interest in seeing her in a reality show. <laughs> wow. And just like that, what you're witnessing is the 15 minutes, which everyone does, being stretched as far as you can. Thanks for being here, guys. Thank you. Thanks, David. Alexandra Edward Michael Mystery is from left to right, right first. Okay. This is what's fantastic. There is no reason you couldn't be sitting in this chair a month from now. I don't want to take your job. But... but. Closed captioning for the Jeff Probst Show provided by... <laughs> Variations on a theme, 15 minutes of fame. Our next guest jumped into the spotlight when he pulled a huge prank in Times Square. He posted a video of it on YouTube, getting over one and a half million hits in the first 96 hours it was online. Roll it. My name is Brett. I'm 21 years old living in New York City, the greatest city in the world. My whole life, I've always wondered what it would feel like to be famous. Nowadays, it seems like anyone can achieve fame. Why can't I do it too? So I came up with this crazy idea. I could probably walk around these same streets tonight and immediately become the center of attention just by appearing to be important. To pull this off, I changed my appearance to make myself look like a typical celebrity. Then I gathered an entourage and came up with a plan of action. I'll have bodyguards, assistants, and a few photographers follow me around Times Square, and of course I'll bring along a camera crew to film every second of it. What did you think of him? I think I think he's excellent. I think he's absolutely awesome. I think he's got a great future in, uh, in the movie business, and I just took a picture with him. You know what I mean? I feel special. We'll walk past thousands of people. They'll have no idea who I am or where I'm from, but they're all going to fall for it. It's a crazy uh, example of how fame-hungry our culture is. Yeah. Just to be clear, none of this is real. You're just a guy. You went out, and people started saying you're a great actor. Yeah, it's insane. Um, what I, was I the original idea? Were you, trying to, were you trying to almost make fun of celebrity and show how easy it is? The original idea was to just have that as the base for a comedy video. I just wanted it to be funny. Um, it turned out to be a huge social experiment. It turned out to make a huge point about how celebrity hungry our culture is. Now, I'm looking at you now. You look different as well now. You, you, you had a very different haircut and a t-shirt, and now you look very much like a guy appearing on a talk show to talk about his new movie. So how has it changed you? It's been fun, stressful and fun. It's been going on talk shows, doing news, and also talking about potential future projects. To Which is crazy, because there was no project. <laughs> this is what's fantastic. There is no reason you couldn't be sitting in this chair a month from now, or by the end <laughs> of the day if some exec is watching, and now suddenly I'm pining to be the guest, right? Yeah, I mean, you... I don't want to take your job. <laughs> But, but maybe we can coexist. <laughs> so are you noticing a difference in how people treat you if, when they find out, oh, you're the guy from the... 
Does it, is it in that instant when they realize you're famous that they realize I'm supposed to treat you differently now? People have treated me a little bit differently, not in a crazy way, but I, I get recognized now. People on the street recognize me from the video. And what do they say? Because it is really a great example of being famous for being famous. Yes, famous for being famous. So what do they say? I like your what? Your video? They say they love the video. They're like, oh, you're totally making fun of the Kardashians. And in, in a weird way, it all started with a video, just like with them. <laughs> and another great uh, necessity in being a good guest, funny anecdotes, well-timed, well-delivered, nice <laughs> job. Take it, Brian, get a shot down here, because we have what I think, if, especially if you get the full wise shot, including all four of these guys, your entourage. I mean, this yeah. is your entourage. And I couldn't have done it without them, and I, I totally admit that. They were unbelievable. <laughs> and but wait, Brett, go with me here in a sense yeah. of humor. You actually brought four people with you. That's what celebrities do. Yes. <laughs> and, and you said, I need to have them sit in the audience. And you have a bodyguard who has sunglasses and has not smiled at me yet. I'm trying to figure out what I did wrong. <laughs> and then your two buddies in the middle, these are the guys that helped you tell the story? Yes. Um, Mr. E is my bodyguard. Um, <laughs> Mike was one of the cameramen. He edited the video. What about the girlfriend? She wasn't even there that night. She only saw pictures from it. And when the video came out, she saw that, uh, wow, I did something really insane this summer and that her boyfriend's life was about to totally change. And hers as well. So, Alexandra, your life changes as well. Yeah. And if, if we go with the celebrity idea, now the question for you is, will he stay faithful now that he has so many <laughs> options? I would hope so. I would hope so. But you're, you see this, right? You're now a character in this charade. Of course. But I know he's very loyal. We've been going out for almost a year now. And I think we know each other. Um, I wasn't implying. <laughs> I was merely saying, in the context of the celebrity story, how has he changed? He uh, used to be Brett. Now he's Brett. I don't think he's... <laughs> Right? He hasn't changed. He's always been meant for this. He's always had this coming for him. It was all a matter of when it was coming. I think his ego has always been the way it has been, and that's what... Hey, now. <laughs> well, now, wait a minute. That's a very honest and fair thing. You can't put yourself out there, and then it would be one thing if you did the experiment and said, look, I have no interest in this. I just wanted to prove how silly celebrity is. But it's not. You're on talk shows. I am, and it's it's like it's like a dream, and I feel like it's in a way it's not really happening. It's it's insane. Do you like it? Do you like being famous? I love it. I love it. I want more. I want more. <laughs> Who here has a thought on this? Pop up. So. This is a story that's easy to follow. Guy decides he's going to see if he can become famous, and it works. Do you envy him? Do you wish this was you in a way? Um, actually, I think it's fantastic what you're doing. Uh, I wish you all the best. And What is it I he's doing again? Becoming famous, going after what he wants. And I think anyone who can do it should go after it. So, so. thank you. So, <laughs> Brett, is... What she just said was, you're going after what you want, being famous. Is that really it? You want to be famous? It's not that I want fame. I want to entertain. I want to do comedy. I love television. I think I could really put together a really great television program or programming with this crew that I have. So I mean, then let me ask you a question. Yeah. Is the truth that rather than doing a social experiment about fame, this could be a very clever way to get noticed and show you my skills as a comedian, as a filmmaker, a storyteller, and I got a team, we can go do something right now. We can, and we're ready, and it's going to happen. I guarantee you, mark my words, we're gonna do something bigger than this next. This is really Joe's experiment, is can I live off of the kindness of others? What's the worst moment that happened? Are you ready? Yes! Yeah.
Variations on a theme. 15 minutes of fame. Our next guest asked himself a simple question. If I lost everything, could I survive? He explores the answer in his new documentary, Craigslist Joe. Roll it. If I were to venture beyond my immediate surroundings, strip away all my comforts, and throw myself out into the world with no idea of where I'd end up or who I'd meet, then what? Is there any community out there? What would I find? And so in my own small way, I decided to test it out. I'm going to use technology, the very thing that could be isolating us, to try to connect with others. For the next 31 days, I'm going to live entirely off Craigslist. Craigslist. It's a place to go when you're looking for a job or somewhere to live or someone to take that old couch off your hands. I'm going out there with no cash, no credit cards, no ATM stops, not a penny in my pocket. From this point on, anyone I meet, my meals, places to sleep, and transportation will all come from connections made on Craigslist. 6.50 p.m. Nothing has entered my body except for this glass of ice water. I love this idea. Uh, Joe, so where do you come up with it's a really risky, romantic, crazy idea to just live off of what you can come up with in the world? I was uh, working on a movie in uh, Las Vegas, and this was a couple years ago when our country was first entering a recession. And, you know, I'd turn on the news and I'd see reports of people losing, you know, their homes, their life savings. So I got to thinking, like, what would happen if I lost everything? And I didn't have any friends or family I could turn to. Are we at a place in our society where we can take care of each other? So the idea was I'm going to go out with nothing and I'm going to see what will happen. What, what happens on day one? <laughs> day one, uh, I go out there. I had a laptop. A cell phone with a new number with no contacts and then no money. I, I brought a toothbrush. It was like the only other thing I brought. And I'm looking for anyone to connect with, whether it's someone leaving town or someone that just wants to go on a hike, anything. Battery's about to die. I haven't eaten all day. I go to this internet cafe. I'm looking. I see this ad for like a, a surf school, aqua surf school. And I'm putting an ad out looking for any, anyone that could connect with, like a warm meal, a place to sleep. And this isn't like within the next week. This is now. This is, yeah, exactly. I have no idea where I'm going to sleep tonight. I ended up meeting up with this guy, Alan, at this cafe. And he's like, you know what? Uh, what you're doing is a little crazy. I'm not exactly sure <laughs> I understand it yet, but uh, I like it. And uh, you're welcome to stay at my place tonight. Alan. So, he, he, Alan's here with us. So, this is really Joe's experiment, is can I live off of the kindness of others? Will we take care of each other? But this is just a guy you don't know, and you're going to invite him into your life. Any hesitation? Definitely. I had a little bit, and I asked him to meet me at a coffee shop first. <laughs> And uh, I, after speaking with him, there's still that uncertainty, obviously, and I was afraid. But if I don't take a chance on another human, and if I don't try to do something nice, you know, how can I expect the world to become a better place? Wow. It's crazy to me that this is not a scripted bit, that you really went out into the world. What did your friends think about this? Initially, they didn't understand, like, what does it mean to live off Craigslist? And then once I kind of explained, like, I just wanted to do, you know, like a social exploration, like where we're at in our society, like how technology is affecting human interaction. Is this bringing us closer together or is this isolating us? What's the worst moment that happened? Uh, the worst moment was probably uh, I was in New York. I, it was in the middle of winter. I hadn't eaten in probably like two days. And uh, there was one event that I could find on Craigslist. It was this So bar. when you say you hadn't eaten, you, you really had not eaten? I think I had an orange, uh, like, the day before. Okay, wow. Yeah, I, I lost about 15 pounds throughout the month. So worst moment. So, yeah, in New York, in the middle of winter, it's 4 a.m., and it looks like I am going to have no place to sleep. I'm going to be on the streets, you know, tonight. And there was one girl who I would met at this Craigslist event earlier, and she's like... You can't stay at my place. Like, my boyfriend's there. It'll be too weird. I'm like, no problem. <laughs> and uh, 
She ends up driving home, talking to her boyfriend, driving all the way back, and say, you know what? If you want a, a couch to sleep on, you can sleep at my place. So, like, the worst part turned into the best part because after that, I was just so inspired about her generosity that I started volunteering. So. And one of the things we're talking about with this 15 minutes of fame is that you made a documentary, and of course, he found the cameraman. Where else? Craigslist. Yeah. <laughs> about five days before I left, yeah. And you've captured something that clearly is resonating with people, is taking care of each other. How do you stretch that now out? What do you do with this? Well, uh, the first goal is to uh, get as many people to see it as possible. And, um, you know, there are people like Alan that I met all over the country that just wasn't exactly sure what I was doing and was maybe a little skeptical uh, when they met me, but, like, took that chance. And it was a lesson for me, like, if we all can kind of pitch in a little bit, you know, we can make amazing things happen. So. I wish you great luck with this. Thank you, Joe. Awesome experiment. Thank you, very much. you can find Craigslist Joe on iTunes, Amazon.com, and Video On Demand. Guys on the Couch is next. You're good. <laughs> so which ones of these are we doing? We're ready. Looking for Reese and Paul. Come on up. I consider myself to be very funny. You're Lucy looking for your Ricky. <laughs> Closed captioning for the Jeff Probe Show provided by... Guys on the couch looking for Reese and Paul. Come on up. Have a seat, fellas. Are you Reese? I am. Okay, Reese and Paul. All right, this is where we answer questions from women about why guys think the way they do. Looking for Maggie. Hi, Hold on, we'll get your microphone. What's your question, Maggie? I consider myself to be very funny, and often when I'm dating, this can steal the limelight from the guy. How can I share this? Do you mean how do you be yourself without intimidating the guy? Yes. Oh, I think you have an amazing skill then, and what your funny does, it's a barometer for guys you shouldn't date. Because if you're on a date with a guy that can't handle how funny you are, you're like the whole package. Look at you. You're pretty, blonde, you, you've got a great smile. If you're funny to boot and he can't handle it, clearly not the guy for you. Move on. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I'd say you're dating the wrong guys, but, you know, generally as, as also an overbearing type of person, I think it's also a skill that you have to sometimes tamper down and be a good listener as well. Maggie, is that... Yes. Well, okay, so, I mean, so, you know, timing is comedy, right? So yes. a lot of in timing is waiting for that moment and listening until you hit that funny part. You know, yes. you, being funny doesn't mean you're talking over somebody or talking all the time. So you really... Not got, that you're doing that. Mm -hmm. yeah. You really got an A part, B part answer, which yes. is a guy should be able to respect and want you to be funny because that's part of your personality. But I think what Paul's hinting at, too, is you have to have your own barometer of... I'm a little dominating, if that's mm -hmm. the case, or I'm constantly doing shtick and it gets tiring. Does any of that ring true to you? The dominating does a little bit. You know, I'd like to involve the guy more with the fun part of it, share it with him. You're Lucy looking for your Ricky. <laughs> <laughs> He's Thank out there. You. Yes. So Reese is saying, just keep looking. Don't worry about anything because you are who you are. And even if it's dominating. Yes. You're dominating. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Thank so you. So what's your takeaway? My takeaway is just be who I am, relax, and just carry on, and the right guy will come. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Thanks, Maggie. Thank you, Jeff. Where's Lexus? Lexus, what's your question? I'm a single mom, and it makes it difficult to date. Um, at what point should I tell a guy I'm dating that I have a kid? How old are you? I'm 26. How old are the guys you typically date? 30-ish. Uh, th that doesn't have to be, you know, uh, a, a hammer that you swing at somebody, but you're a single mom, you, you, you love your child. That's first date-worthy conversation. Have but, you ever dated a single mom? Yeah, sure have. And how did that go when she told you that she had a kid? This is actually really good. There was one instance where I dated a woman, and very casually, in dinner conversation, she met, you know, so tell me about yourself. 
job, this, I have two kids. Oh, cool. And she told me about her kids. There was another woman that felt the need to sort of shield that from me. And then on the third date, it was, you know, revealed that there was something she couldn't do because she had to get back. She had a sitter. It, it's a part of who you are. You know, if you're, if you feel like you're an open enough person when you're dating, you could say it. And again, not unlike the uh, previous woman, it, if it helps weed out someone that isn't right for you, then you actually have an extra tool in your box to say, not the right guy. Paul, have you ever dated anybody, that a single mom? I never have, no. But I've got a, a, a nine-month-old boy at home who I totally adore. And I think you should just, like, bedazzle the face of your child on everything <laughs> you can. <laughs> Whenever you go out on a date and be like, this is what you're getting. So, yeah. you know, I, you know it's nothing to, nothing to hide and it's nothing to be a, a, ashamed of. Obviously, you want to find someone, you want to find love at some point. And, yeah, I mean, what Reese says, if, if, if that's a make-or-break deal, then, you know, leave it. It is an interesting question, and it, this is a, a common question, right, that women ask guys. You just brought up something, Paul, that's so interesting, that having this beautiful child would actually be a negative in yeah. some way that I had to hide. Right. And yet, clearly from your experience, that's been a question, like, when do I tell him, by the way, it's not just me? Have you had situations where it didn't go so well? Well, um, I'm really open. I let guys know kind of right away because she's the center of my world. That's like my mini-me. We're twins, you know? <laughs> but um, sometimes there are guys that maybe are hesitant to dating someone that has a child because they're not the center of your attention. I'm going to jump right in and say, you're a single mom. You don't have that time to waste. Your child, talk about up front. If you don't like tomatoes, sit on that information until you have a third day. Yeah. Alexis, I'll tell you from my own personal life that there was definitely a time where if I met somebody who was a single mom, it would be a, oh, okay, okay, good to know. Because I wasn't at a point where I wanted that relationship and I wanted a child in my life. But there was another point in my life where I met Lisa and started to fall in love. And the fact that she had two kids was one of the greatest assets I could imagine that I got this family along with this amazing woman. I think, I think Reese really gave you great advice just sitting here listening, which is you really do just have to be who you are. And, and a lot of guys won't be interested in a woman with a child for lots of reasons. They just aren't at that point in their life. Doesn't mean good or bad, but there are guys that will be going, you're kidding, there's someone like you that I would be a part of raising? I'm all in. We're done. Good job. So we're, I'm going to go up to him. It's time to put up or shut up. I know who I want to ambush, and it is you. Come here. <laughs> time for another ambush adventure. I know who I want to ambush, and it is you. Come here, Brett. Come on up. All right, so we know your story. Story is you wanted to be famous, so you made yourself famous, and now you want to extend it. Yeah. All right, I have an ambush adventure for you. Here's how an ambush adventure works. You have to say yes to the adventure before you know what the adventure is. If you say yes, you must complete the adventure. If you do not, you disappoint not only me, but yourself. <laughs> you got to say yes before you know what it is, but once you say yes, you got to do it. Yes. Okay. So the goal is to extend the fame and have a career. Right. Here's your adventure. You have seven days to produce a segment for this show. Tomorrow morning, I want the topic. That's all I need is the topic so we can build the rest of the show around you. We need one tape piece, no longer than 90 seconds, one compelling guest, and what the story is. We'll pay for airfare to get them out here. We'll pay for your crew. The rest is on you. You want to be in TV? You're in TV. Can't wait to see how this turns out. The jury's next. Queen of Versailles, I was shocked at the audience reaction. Oh, my God. I was shocked. We all were. The whole control room was they, like... They, almost, they gave them a half a standing ovation yeah. at the end of the show. Yeah. I have to say, I went into that story thinking it would be something different. And I was surprised. 
and I found them likable. Okay, so that begs the question, did we tell the story properly on tape? Because when I saw the movie, and I think we shared this reaction, it was hard not to think that they were outrageously excessive and a little bit... Um, out of touch? I think the difficulty <laughs> in doing a show like this is there's the documentary which exists but has been filtered through the eyes of a filmmaker. Mm -hmm. There are the subjects, mm -hmm. in this case David and Jackie, who feel like they've been represented fairly or unfairly, mm -hmm. but we're telling one side of it. When you see the documentary, you'll see a different side. And the truth is, like always, somewhere in the middle. There's certainly some insight talk about the fake celebrity. How do you think he really feels about on, having on. to pull off a segment in a week? Out of his head happy. Really? Yeah. I sensed a little anxiety. Yeah. Oh, well, some nervousness. Yeah. yeah, that's how it should feel. You want to play in the big leagues, you got to step up. But he's got a bat in his hand and a pitch is being thrown. Mm -hmm. He's going to get a swing, and I have a feeling they'll do something really interesting. Uh, when he called on me, that was totally unexpected. I didn't know what I was saying yes to. I knew it was going to be something really good. The best has yet to come. I absolutely think I'll be able to pull this off.